shall we start? Ladies first? No, you should do it. I think it sounds really nice with your accent. Uh, Airheads, let's do it. Hello and welcome to Airheads, a not-so-serious look at the serious business of royal rumours, gossip and gowns. I'm Tom. And I'm Maeve. And we are back after our Christmas holiday break. Tom, I'm going to ask you like I have no idea, but how was your Christmas? (laughs) Did you watch the Queen's speech? (laughs) I sort of watched the Queen's speech by proxy because my mum randomly put it on her phone. We actually never watched the Queen's Christmas message in our house, but my mum put it on and before I knew it, my mum and my auntie were both in tears. (laughs) Sorry. (laughs) No, I like I couldn't believe it. It's actually very rare, I think, for either of us, I guess, to be around monarchists and to see like how you're meant to react to the stuff that the royals uh, do in their eyes. Yeah, I watched a little bit of the Channel Four alternative Christmas message because I heard they did a deep fake Queen, and it was really naff. Yeah, <laughs> not was... as good as the real thing. <laughs> disappointing because you know you've seen like some amazing deep fakes and I thought they could possibly do something really cool but the actress they had doing the queen's voice just didn't sound like her at all right and the stuff they had her do was like not funny they had her do like a tiktok challenge like dancing (laughs) on her desk and it was just shit (laughs) honestly but the real queen decided to bring some serious heat (laughs) starting 2021 we got an epic piece in the daily mail last weekend that i have been dying to talk to you about written by the daily mail's royal editor rebecca english and this piece was ostensibly revisiting the story we've talked about before of the queen refusing prince harry's request to lay a wreath on his behalf on remembrance sunday but it also revealed loads of other details on like where things stand between the sussexes and the rest of the family very much from the family's perspective (laughs) (laughs) it being the daily mail the whole wreath drama If you need reminding, Rebecca English says, The story around at the time, and it was not publicly corrected because the royals felt strongly it was disrespectful to turn the nation's act of remembrance into a family row, was that palace officials had made the decision without discussing it with Harry's grandmother. I guess they feel that enough time has passed that it is no longer disrespectful to turn the nation's act of remembrance into a family (laughs) row. (laughs) Because, Rebecca English goes on, it was the Queen alone who was behind the refusal, and it took her all of two seconds to make up her mind. Wow. Oof. Fucking hell. They've got a source who says, it was the Queen's decision, and what's more, she actually had very strong views on the subject. Tom, what is the point of this? When I was reading this, and it it was on the front page of the mail last Saturday, I think as far as I can remember I was thinking like who does this serve like because it struck me as the royals basically like shrieking into the void yeah yeah, yeah <laughs> like yeah. this this constant refrain of like we broke up with them and we don't miss them at all and they're never allowed back and we didn't want them anyway like <laughs> <laughs> but it just seemed to me like such a reminder of how petty these people are to to start off the new year with this kind of like really nasty story yeah especially as it was a story that while big at the time had gone away and you know people had moved on and then again the royal family dig something up to kind of give their own take on it and i really feel like not saying this at the time was way more about protecting the queen than this like feeling like it's disrespectful because i think that the queen could have possibly come under quite a lot of fire for denying people the opportunity to pay respects to soldiers like which is kind of how i see it it's very odd then that they decide that this is the tack they want to take in 2021 so that was kind of the top line of the story but then because this friday marked one year since prince harry and Meghan markle's announcement that they would be stepping back as senior working royals and so this piece kind of 
emphasizes in general the queen's role in rejecting Harry and Meghan's proposed plans for their progressive new role in the royal family that it was not prince charles it was not prince william it was all her she's got so tired of this like war between will and charles and she's just stepping in to say like you're both just little boys waiting for me to die i have all the power (laughs) darth sidious So a source says that Harry was told very clearly in January by his grandmother that you work for the monarchy. The monarchy doesn't work for you. And if you can't accept that, then you need to walk away. Her Majesty was remarkably clear and decisive on that point and has never deviated from it. Not once. The decisive hand of the Queen. Yeah. She's got another source who says... The deals Harry and Meghan have done since moving to California clearly show the truth of it. They simply had ambitions that were completely incompatible with being members of the royal family. And the source also says, It was their choice to leave and seek their fortunes elsewhere. No one exiled them. (laughs) Indeed, the Queen made clear she didn't want Harry and Meghan to go and that they are still very much loved members of her family and have her support. (laughs) That is fucking bullshit. (laughs) Truly, how supportive is it to direct your aides to leak a story like this, enormously mean-spirited story, to the very same newspaper that Megan is currently suing? And, I mean, all this bullshit about, like, we didn't exile them, like... So, round one, they created this toxic atmosphere when Harry and Meghan were in the royal family, um, and then expected them to put up with it and stay. And now, with these kind of stories, they're trying to extend that toxic atmosphere to cover the whole world through this kind of nasty reporting that is covered globally. And I think, you know, obviously we don't know where this story came from, and we can't definitively say that it was the Queen sending her aides to do a story like this. But if the whole point of the story is that the Queen is so decisive and she's the boss that makes all the decisions... If she has such a steady hand on everything, then you can't really accept that she has these leaky courtiers who are behaving without her permission. So true. (laughs) (laughs) Anyway, the source goes on. Harry and Meghan are clearly where they want to be and good luck to them. But their subsequent career choices have scuppered any chance of retaining even a quasi-official royal role. God, I'm just longing for that (laughs) quasi-official royal role. (laughs) But some of these career choices that earn a mention, all of these happened since our last episode, which is crazy. But there is the Sussex's New Deal with Spotify to host their Archwell audio podcast, which we'll be talking about later. And as well as that, Megan's recent investment in Clever Blends, an oat milk latte startup in Santa Barbara, which Megan included in a gift basket she sent to Oprah for Christmas. And Oprah then shared on her own Instagram grid, seemingly without payment as well, which shows... She means business. Yeah. And she used a crown emoji (laughs) in the caption, (laughs) which people over here have been losing their minds over she said her neighbor m yes that m crowd emoji (laughs) sent to her (laughs) but this instagram caption was beyond the pale for those in the palace yeah reports over here said that this instagram caption was seen in the opinion of many in the royal household as not just clumsy but arguably a direct contravention of Meghan and harry's promise not to bring the monarchy into disrepute i mean Who the fuck are they to talk about Oprah's use of social media? Fuck's sake, (laughs) clumsy use of social media from this, like, hundreds-year-old institution. (laughs) So stupid. Like, if I had time and made any money from this podcast, I could definitely see myself going and looking at every Instagram post that any tangential celebrity person that has ever met Kate and Will or any of the royals had posted about it because I would fucking bet they have used a crown yeah. emoji. It's the first thing I would do. I think, think we did when we went to Trooping <laughs> that, that time because, you know, it's the most obvious emoji. Anyway, the source tells Rebecca English... It just goes to underline the Queen's judgment. The Queen knows you can't have a working member of the royal family also being paid millions of pounds by Spotify to tell people to swipe and follow their podcast. (laughs) That's definitely how it works. Or encouraging consumers to buy a certain brand of coffee. 
The two are simply incompatible. Unless, like, you're doing adverts for milk, which you can do as a member of the royal family. (laughs) (laughs) Rebecca English adds that any chance of future royal roles for Harry and Meghan after the one-year probationary period is now dead in the water, according to sources who say it's solely down to the choices they've made. There is no anger or animosity on behalf of the royal family, but every commercial deal that has been done by the Sussexes has been a nail in the coffin of any kind of return to royal life. Definitely sounds like there's no anger or animosity yeah. there. <laughs> um, I love using, like, coffin analogies when I'm, like, really happy with someone. <laughs> Her report does also note that it is unlikely Harry will be able to get back any military roles that might have been left open for him. But... She says there are categorically no plans to strip them of their titles. And she says to strip Harry and Meghan of their titles would just be punitive. And whatever else the royal family are, say insiders, they are not petty. That's incredible <laughs> to say that. I mean, after like the the impetus of this story is the Queen won't let Harry lay a wreath to honour dead soldiers. The impetus of this story is the Queen wouldn't let Harry lay a wreath two months ago and she's still <laughs> talking about it. <laughs> so petty so funny I loved this bit Rebecca English says she heard that Megan possibly flippantly told friends at one point that she would happily hand back her title which was a wedding gift from the Queen there is no suggestion that she wishes to do so however it seems that being a Duchess or a Duke for that matter carries a useful cachet in the US for the time being this is like the horror. Can you imagine someone flippantly saying that they would happily hand back a title that they were given as a gift from the Queen? <laughs> oh my God. But our American listeners do quite regularly tell us that no one in America cares about their titles. But like clearly Harry and Meghan do. Yeah, they use them all the time. They are credited at the end of their... Spotify podcast as a Duke and Duchess of Sussex in the Netflix deal, Duke and Duchess of Sussex at the end of Megan's Disney documentary she did the voiceover for Elephant, it was Duchess of Sussex they are holding on to those Yeah, I mean, and I guess while they have them they should use them I I do feel like No, they shouldn't (laughs) (laughs) They should get used to calling themselves Harry and Megan Yeah, it's true, because I do feel like being Duke and Duchess has like done everything it's going to do for their brand like them getting rid of the titles as we've discussed many times on this podcast will not diminish them in anybody's eyes or anybody who matters but speaking of people who matter how does the rest of the family feel about all this yeah later in this daily mail piece rebecca english talks a little bit about how the other members are handling this now and she says prince charles refuses to even discuss the issue in an attempt to keep family relations civil, which is an interesting approach. Yeah, this like... Don't talk about it. (laughs) (laughs) Prince William, though, has been left with painfully deep scars that may never be healed. And he was also deeply hurt by suggestions from the Sussex camp that he, and particularly his wife, had cold-shouldered Meghan. That was a, a curious little tidbit, I thought particularly his wife. Yeah, is he suggesting that the Sussexes are like having a go at Kate way more than him or that Kate's more responsible for it than he is? I think everything we've heard from the Sussex camp is that it's between the brothers. Yeah, absolutely. He's maybe trying to switch the focus a little bit. But Rebecca English does claim that Kate and Sophie Wessex repeatedly reached out to Meghan, particularly after the ITV doc with Tom Bradby about the Africa tour, but they were rebuffed. And I have to say, if you only reach out to someone after they've, like, gone on national TV to say that nobody is, like, asking them if they're okay, then, like, that's pretty fucked. Like, you can't suddenly be like, oh, excuse me, oh, are you okay? I'm so sorry, I didn't get back to you before. Like, (laughs) bullshit. It is funny that this piece ends with the claim that the Cambridges are said to have become stronger as a couple than ever. We get a quote from a friend who says of Will, he's loosened up a lot. They both have, in fact. As a couple, William and Kate are quite cautious. People expect them to be very confident, but they aren't. Not naturally, anyway. Everything that's happened this year has changed that. They've done a really sterling job. Who was this friend calling her Kate and not Catherine? (laughs) (laughs) I definitely think you, like, really can't say they've done a sterling job after the 
what I consider to be disastrous royal tour, and when the last thing we saw of them in 2020 was them accidentally bumping into the Wessexes and Viscount Seven and his family at that uh, winter wonderland walk in Windsor. www.stupidcambridges.com <laughs> 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 The piece concludes with Rebecca English asking, will the family be reconciled? The litmus test will be the Duke of Edinburgh's 100th birthday in June, which is followed by the planned unveiling at Kensington Palace of the long-awaited memorial statue to Princess Diana, COVID permitting. Those fucking things aren't going to happen. The yeah. palace has just cancelled all of their garden parties for the entire year. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they're probably not going to have a big in-person celebration for the Duke of Edinburgh. Hello, this is Maven Tom beaming in from the future, because on Saturday, just after we finished recording, Buckingham Palace announced that the Queen and Prince Philip had both been vaccinated against COVID-19. Very exciting news! I know! I was interested to read that these vaccines were administered by a household doctor at Windsor Castle. And the source of the palace said that the Queen had decided that she would let it be known that she has had the vaccination to prevent inaccuracies and further speculation. There are a few unanswered questions, though, about this. We don't know what vaccine they received, although the Mail on Sunday sources say that it's the Oxford AstraZeneca one. I mean, I feel like if it was the British vaccine, (laughs) they would have been like shouting it from the rooftops. But hey, what do I know? And we also don't know when they're going to receive their second dose. The protocol over here at the moment is is that it'll be delayed by like 12 weeks. But when Queen Margareta of Denmark got vaccinated recently, the palace stated that she would receive her second dose three weeks later. Although all we've heard is a source in the mail on Sunday who said that they had their first job only when it became available to others in the Berkshire area to avoid any suggestion of special treatment. The same will apply to the second injection expected in a few weeks. I mean, except that it was administered by a private doctor. So there (laughs) was special treatment. The reports recently had suggested that the Queen wouldn't confirm when or even if she had received the vaccine, um, as this was a personal medical matter. At the same time, though, we kind of knew, like, it, they were going to confirm it. And I saw the the former BBC royal correspondent Peter Hunt pointing out, as head of state of a country desperately relying on the vaccine to provide a path out of lockdown, the Queen and her husband had little choice but to be vaccinated and to make it public that they'd both been jabbed. He also called the Queen and Philip vaccine influencers, <laughs> which I love, because the reaction from the government over here was fucking ecstatic you had mps talking about their delight that they had made this announcement saying that it, it was a great day for the uk that there was a royal ray of hope and all the stuff <laughs> which does seem you know particularly tone deaf following the highest daily death toll since the pandemic began but you know it's not, this isn't the first time that the Queen has been a vaccine influencer. In 1957, amid widespread public anxiety about the potential side effects of a new polio vaccine, the Queen let it be known that Prince Charles and Princess Anne, who were then eight and six years old, had received the vaccine. I would have liked to see them take it a bit further, though, this time, rather than just an announcement. Like, we could have had some photos or, or, or something to accompany it. Yeah, they should have done it on TV, like Elvis getting the polio vaccine, or Joe Biden and and Kamala Harris. I think the Queen was probably worried that if there were pictures of her with her sleeve rolled up, we'd be able to see her tattoos. (laughs) But I wonder, because actually it was Prince Charles who was the real vaccine influencer in the polio days. He's the one that got it. So maybe we will get, you know, a broadcast of him receiving the vaccine with Camilla possibly at some stage. I feel like they would. I feel like Charles is very comfortable being the public royal face of all things coronavirus. <laughs> there there was lots of commentary online and from people like the anti marcus group Republic saying like, who cares about these two getting the vaccine? But like we've said this so many times before that the royal family's 
core demographic is people over 70. Yeah. Like people over 70 generally love the queen and if they have any concerns about the vaccine then seeing this woman showing that she thinks it is safe and necessary to get a vaccine is going to go a long way to easing their concerns and encouraging them to get the vaccination themselves. So I think it, it was a smart and a very important move. And I think you could see that there was a little bit of strategy in it, the fact that they did it on a Saturday and made that announcement in time that it would, and it did make a lot of the front pages on Sunday. You had headlines like the Mail on Sunday saying the Queen launches Britain's jab blitz and the Express going with Queen and Duke lead the way. Yeah, and the Sunday Times reports that the Queen will return to London in June and that she's determined to get back to business with Trooping the Colour. Yeah, I'm not so sure about that. That seems like very premature. I mean, just because she's safe now doesn't mean everybody else is. Like, there's still going to be loads of people who need vaccinating at that time. But speaking of back to business, this concludes our interlude from the future. But I think it's come to that time. <laughs> it's time for us to talk about Archwell Audio. When we do a, a podcast about a podcast. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. It was great that the Sussexes took up the slack for when we wanted to take a break over Christmas. They thought <laughs> they would, you know, put something out just so that our listeners would have something to, to do. How did you feel when you heard the news about Harry and Meghan's Spotify deal? Well, of course, I'm no stranger to being offered millions of pounds to a podcast. <laughs> um, unlike... The Sussexes, I actually turned that down and decided to do this for free. <laughs> Keep things independent. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, I thought it made a lot of sense in terms of them following the kind of Obama template, which, you know, we've heard a lot that that's something they're interested in doing. Yeah, I mean, as soon as I heard it, I knew this is not going to be my kind of thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I do not listen to wellness podcasts or really any very earnest podcasts, mm. no celebrity podcasts, just not my kind of thing at all. So straight away, I was like, I 1000% am not the target audience for this. And neither am I, even if you put Elton John on it. <laughs> my name is Elton John. <laughs> but it is very interesting to see how Harry and Meghan are going like, to build up their post-royal brand. And like the podcast is definitely a big part of that. Yeah, absolutely. And they, so they started by releasing a little two minute trailer, which Tom and I sort of spoofed a little bit. Maybe, maybe you got that. (laughs) I do think it's going to take me a while to get used to Harry saying things like hit the subscribe button or whatever. So here's what you need to do. Tap follow right now. Go ahead. Go on. Tap follow. (laughs) That was really weird. But I, I thought like, you know, parts of that were a little bit naff, but I really liked the end bit where Megan's like no he has a podcast voice I thought that was pretty funny (laughs) so then I was quite surprised when they released the holiday special and I would flag that they called it a holiday special not a Christmas special like as if we needed a reminder that this is squarely aimed at an American market rather than a UK market the mail reported that the podcast launched at number 17 on the Spotify podcast charts (laughs) below deep sleep sounds of whale noises <laughs> which i thought was so funny but also wakes me up to the fact that we're also way below the whale sounds <laughs> <laughs> we're not even on the chart but they did go up to number seven and you know they might go higher than that very good for a first episode not everyone can be joe rogan <laughs> <laughs> unfortunately christ but Anyway, this is so a holiday special, 33 minutes long, with appearances from, by my count, 14 guests, including James Corden, for some reason. Using his, like, particularly annoying, I'm being earnest and humble voice. I'm doing, a, <laughs> like, a charity appearance voice. Drives me mad. Harry and Meghan don't interview any of their guests. They asked them to submit audio diaries which means that the contributions, if you haven't listened to them yet, they vary quite a lot in tone and, I don't know, is value the right word? (laughs) 
like in in regards to whether what they're saying is worthwhile yeah there's like no chance for an interviewer to kind of uh, intervene and like go further on certain things or steer topics away from stuff which maybe is a bit less relevant i thought the guardian's review put it pretty well when they said harping on about the power of connection is ironic if you don't actually get close to interviewing your interviewees (laughs) Yeah, and it, it made me um, think, like, is, is this kind of montage style going to be something that they continue? I, I don't think so. I yeah. doubt it. But it, it makes sense for something like a holiday special, I guess. But mm-hmm. it was curious to me because Harry talks about how they didn't want to have to navigate the awkward world of video calling and trying to do an interview with someone and someone's on mute and all this stuff and I was wondering like how is that going to work in future with this podcast like you're going to need to do the video call to do the podcast yeah presumably. anyway the production of it is really great though and according to the end credits they have a pretty big team working on it but I was surprised by how scripted their interactions with each other were some of them I thought were a lot more successful than others. <laughs> yeah, Harry's joke about being on mute and how that's like one of the most defining phrases of 2020 was pretty cringe, I thought. Yeah, and they so they end it by including a clip from This Little Light of Mine, which played at the end of their wedding. And Megan prefaces it by saying, no matter what life throws at you guys, trust us when we say love always wins. And then Harry says... Love always wins. And then Megan says, So true. (laughs) As if she didn't just say the exact same thing. It's great. It's iconic. I love that. How many times an episode, like it was three in this one. How many times an episode is she going to say, so true? (laughs) I hope she does one more every episode. (laughs) It it just makes me think of that Sabrina the Teenage Witch episode where Sabrina (laughs) clones herself and is only programmed to say, three things like mr pool can be so annoying (laughs) so true okay and i want me to be a good listener so let's try that is so true that is so true and we need a universal truth oh that's easy mr pool can be so annoying mr pool can be so annoying right at the end of the show they had another special guest you know this was the first thing i really heard about the episode was that archie makes an appearance oh yeah he joins them at the very end to wish their listeners happy new year and it is very very sweet yeah this was my favorite not not only because you know we got to hear archie which you know that's great but it was like my favorite interaction between harry and megan like it felt like natural and and yeah absolutely talking to each other I thought it was smart of them because they know they probably do need to give some kind of insight into their personal life to hook people and make headlines. And I thought this was a very effective way to do it because it meant they could do that without giving too much away, which they clearly feel photographs of Archie do. Yeah. But I think the most important question is... Does Archie have a British or American accent, Tom? I mean, I think he definitely has an American accent, and I love it. I think it's the best fuck you to the Queen you could possibly do. <laughs> it's so good. After me. Ready? Happy? Happy? Happy. New? New? New. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I know a lot of people thought it was like half and half, because the new sounds kind of British. Mm. it'll be interesting and something we will be following closely yeah yeah (laughs) going forward but this clip of archie's voice followed the sussex's rather unusual approach to the traditional royal christmas card which i had wondered if they would even do anymore i had assumed that they wouldn't they they did do so obviously they released an illustrated card which was based on a photo of harry and megan and archie with their dogs taken by megan's mother doria ragland and it was shared via the british animal charity mayhew of which megan is patron and of which we are big fans yeah we love them didn't love the card so much if i'm honest yeah i i did think it was like a nice sentiment to have 
this full color card after the previous two years having those black and white images and you know as people who do not want to provide any fodder for the tabloids it allowed them to avoid giving a photo of Archie that could be reprinted over and over again you couldn't even see his face in it they just had the red hair on his head yeah but ultimately I thought it was pretty disappointing and it honestly struck me as kind of weird to get a British charity to release what to me looks like fan art of your family like just don't release one (laughs) at all yeah I mean I'm just kind of not a fan of that style of illustration I do understand the motivation for doing this and as a way to draw attention to the Mayhew I'm sure it brought a lot of clicks for them Not as much as a picture of them with the dogs, though. (laughs) This has also published a letter for 2021 on their revamped Archwell site, which features two pictures, one of Harry as a child with Diana and the other of Meghan as a child with Doria. The start of this letter is, I think, the most interesting part It starts, I am my mother's son, and I am our son's mother. Together we bring you Archwell. Yeah, it was really striking to me that Harry is clearly aligning himself with Diana here. Like, there's no mention of Charles or any the rest of his family at all, which I suppose is one way to avoid being accused of exploiting your royal connections. And it also, I thought, seems to suggest that he will be following Diana's blueprint for a career outside the royal family. So true. (laughs) (laughs) What did you think of the design? I think it's a nice website. Like, we've talked about design being quite, like, influencery and the kind of neutral tones being very trendy. And they've obviously, like, extended that across the whole site. The, The addition that I was surprised at and didn't like so much was the little icon that they have at the beginning I guess is this uh, logo for Archwell um, as opposed to that kind of word mark but it's that oval with an A and a W and I can see the logic in it It has the line representing the ground and the well is below ground and the arch is above the ground but (laughs) there's just something about it which I didn't like so much and also it's in like quite a harsh black which clashes a bit with the like very dark grey that they use for the text and stuff on the rest of the site. Yeah, and just like having the tab open on my computer, I thought it looked a little bit like like a chain of hotels or something yeah. with that little icon. I was also struck by all of the American spellings. Yeah. As if the, we needed any further evidence that their base will continue to be in America and not in the UK. They are throwing around those center C-E-N-T-E-R's <laughs> like it's going out of fashion. Yeah, I think that their US focus is very clear when you see the kind of institutions and organizations that they're going to be working with. Because before Christmas, we had said one of the things we really wanted for 2021 was some clarity on what Archwell is and what their plans are. And obviously, as loyal listeners of Airheads, they were like, yes, that's what that's what we need to do. So they've given us some more information, some clarifications, and we can start with a definition Archwell, through its non-profit work as well as creative activations, drives systemic cultural change across all communities. Creative activations? Yeah. Um, on its own, this doesn't do a lot for me, but they do back it up with like, a lot more actual information. Yeah, and we've got a little bit of a slogan, compassion in action, with three branches. Archwell Productions, which is the Netflix deal, Archwell Audio, Spotify deal, and the Archwell Foundation. This is the kind of new bit that we were confused about. The new details we got about the Archwell Foundation is that it is an impact-driven non-profit and they list five projects and partnerships on the website. The first one is that Archwell will support research and education on techniques for developing compassion and promoting altruism at the Centre for Compassion and Altruism Research and Education at Stanford Medicine. So that's what they were doing at Stanford that time. Oh, yeah. They also say they have partnered with the Centre for Humane Technology to create the conditions for safer, more compassionate online communities. And 
they had featured the co-founder Tristan Harris on the Time 100 Talks episode that they did last year, but that we did not watch. Yeah, they've also got another one that they are establishing the Archwell Foundation Fund for the UCLA Center for Critical Internet Inquiry, whose mission is described as reimagining technology, championing racial and economic justice in the tech sector, and strengthening democracy through culture making and public policy work. So those two together really emphasize that they are working on creating a more compassionate internet yeah. <laughs> or online communities or whatever. They also support the Loveland Foundation, an organization that focuses on providing affordable and accessible mental health services to black women and girls, which was founded by Rachel Cargill, who was one of the guests on the Archwell Audio Holiday Special. And another one who was also an Archwell Audio guest is their joint philanthropic partnership with the chef Jose Andres's World Central Kitchen. And the Archwell Foundation will be providing a financial commitment to build four community relief centres in regions disproportionately impacted by hunger, starting in Dominica, which they note is a Commonwealth country, (laughs) and Puerto Rico. And these centres, they say, will act as emergency service kitchens during times of high need or disaster, and as food distribution hubs, schools, clinics, or safe community gathering zones during non-disaster times. So that fits in very neatly with their previous work on Mm. food poverty and stuff like that so yeah all this like makes a lot of sense to me i mean i don't really know what the compassion and altruism research stuff is going to be about but i i'm eager to find out yeah absolutely and i love seeing them working with like pre-existing organizations that are having like really tangible effects already and you think like with harry and megan's uh, the awareness that they bring that these kind of places can just be magnified and their effect becomes like so much greater so that's really good i think what have we got for our quote of the week tom we've got camilla finally we get to talk about camilla she was talking to charlie maxey about his book the boy the horse the fox and the mole and she revealed i spent my whole life as a child doodling horses <laughs> which is amazing <laughs> My whole life as a child. <laughs> it's yeah. funny. It's quite philosophical. I mean, we do live our whole lives as children in some ways, don't we? <laughs> so true. Um, well, we know that Camilla loves to read, but I was very excited to hear about this artistic side to her as well. Often overshadowed by what People magazine describes as her painter husband, Charles. <laughs> Such a funny description of Charles. <laughs> I love that. But this was part of a conversation for the launch of her new Instagram book club, The Reading Room. Oh my god, move over Kaya Gerber. (laughs) This follows, as I'm sure all our head listeners will remember, Camilla's two reading lists, book recommendations that she posted last year. But this is a new project urging people to discover new books and meet the extraordinary people who create them. So it officially launches this week. But The Boy, The Horse, The Fox and the Mole is the first book she's cho- chosen. I feel like it's kind of a weird book to choose because it was so huge over here. It yeah. was the Waterstones book of the year, 2019. It is not, <laughs> you know, a little known gem or anything like that. And like, I don't think that a Camilla book club is going to have the same global effect as, say, like even like Will and Kate would have in terms of making things popular in America if that book isn't already popular in America I don't really know but yeah she's like preaching to the choir but hey she gets to talk about doodling horses that's great (laughs) I also thought it was an interesting book for them to choose because uh, Charlie Maxey's whole like brand is about kindness and like reaching out to people and compassion and hugs and things and in this conversation he talks about one of his illustrations that really like blew up on Instagram and it was part of the impetus for him to make a full book. The horse character says that the bravest thing he's ever said is help. And it seemed to me like this really flies in the face of the traditional royal approach to life, which is that you should like never complain, never explain, always have a stiff upper lip. And I felt like even with the younger royals who claim that they're all about compassion and, uh, you know, being uh, very mindful of each other's mental health and stuff. I mean, Will's actions don't really support that at all either. So I thought it was an interesting book to have in the royal sphere. Yeah, I am very interested to see what she picks going forward. Mm-mm. Probably not going to read this one, but, you know, I'm open to reading whatever she picks next. Yeah. 
What about fit for a queen? Well, it's not a new outfit, but I did want to talk about the portrait of Kate that Kensington Palace released on Saturday to mark her 39th birthday. And this is a photo we saw recently. It's from the Royal Train Tour. And it shows Kate in her, the navy Hobbs coat and a cream jumper with faux pearl earrings by Simone Rocha and those blue floral Amaya masks that she loves so much. We talked about this on our last episode, I think, because we preferred this outfit with the fair isle jumper that she changed into Mm. later. But I just thought it was so interesting for them to use a photo of her in a mask yeah. Because, you know, she had the mask off a lot on this tour. <laughs> yeah. so there were plenty of her with the mask off. And I think that choice of image combined with the caption is obviously very deliberate. The caption read, Birthdays have been very different in recent months and our thoughts continue to be with all those working on the front line at this hugely challenging time. Yeah, very much like duty focused and like thinking of others and stuff like that. And, you know, a royal in a mask is what we now associate with royals doing duty rather than like a picture of her with the kids mask off at home around family. I thought that the other photos that the royal accounts posted were significant too. Clarence House posted a photo of Kate in a t-shirt from during the summer and the royal family posted to one of her in that sort of scouting cosplay outfit with the really wild waistcoat and then one of her with the Queen from the Chelsea Flower Show last year. And I thought those, it was a much more casual approach, a lot less formal than previous years. Like last year, Clarence House used a photo of Kate and Camilla from Trooping, and the Royal Family used one from the Queen's Diamond Jubilee tour, both of Kate in like the full Duchess drag with a hat and, and everything on, you know? So this is a very different tone. Yeah. She still does have Duchess hair in these photos, though. Oh, yeah. (laughs) And I I think, though, because on on Friday, the UK saw the highest daily death toll since the pandemic began and we're now back in very strict lockdown, it makes sense that the royals would want to be seen to be, you know, attuned to the moment and to have this photo of Kate in a mask and the caption acknowledging the circumstances and all that stuff, you know, perhaps they're conscious of the criticism of the train tour and they don't want to be seen or accused as being tone deaf. So they're doing a kind of different way of emphasizing that she is of the people and just like us and she's following the guidelines and all doing that kind of stuff. Doing her bit. <laughs> <laughs> But she's not, she's not actually really just like us. She is the future queen, Tom. And don't you ever forget <laughs> I think Kate is first in line this week. And I'm going to turn to a piece in the Telegraph to explain why. <laughs> <laughs> this was by Camilla Tomini, who reports that at 39, Kate has finally come of age. And she is a formidable royal force to be reckoned with. And, you know, a lot of this is the same kind of talking points that we've been hearing a lot since Meghan entered the picture, basically. Stuff that we've been hearing about Kate the Future Queen. But I thought there were some choice lines that we could mention. It starts with, It is telling that despite almost two decades on the royal scene, she has only recently reached the pinnacle of her potential powers by delivering a career-defining speech before Christmas. What is that telling you, Tom? <laughs> um, <laughs> it is incredible, this piece. Like, the way they talk about her very slow rise to power. You're buying... You're drinking the Kool-Aid there, Tom. <laughs> She's not risen anywhere. She's not done anything. This this piece is about the gymnastics you have to do to believe that Kate is hardworking. <laughs> The speech you're talking about is the five big insights speech, which has been totally wiped from my memory. Yeah, blink and you'll miss it. Tommy goes on. It seems that the history of art graduates' softly, softly approach has been her making. Unlike Diana, Princess of Wales, who was thrown in at the deep end, or the Duchess of Sussex, who seemed in a rush to make a difference, Kate has bided her time, which is (laughs) a 
That's one way to put it. Holy fuck. This rebranding laziness. <laughs> what this is. The piece uh, quotes Kate's biographer, Katie Nichol, who says, The weighty Katie tag has actually stood her in good stead as a future queen. Kate has always been a slow burner. The palace allowing her to take her time over the courses she's chosen to champion means she's doing something she's absolutely passionate about. Nothing has been done in a hurry, <laughs> which has allowed her to find her comfort zone, <laughs> which is apparently doing as little as possible. That was not Katie Nichols' words. <laughs> Nothing has been done in a hurry. So funny. Understatement. Does this not read kind of like a small child's school report? <laughs> like nursery school teachers trying to find something really nice to say about all the kids, no matter what? <laughs> Well, according to one source, Kate has found her voice because she actually has something she wants to say. (laughs) But we probably have to wait another 10 years before she actually says it. This insider adds, It is not an exaggeration to say she has become an expert in the field of early years learning. (laughs) Yes, it is an exaggeration to say she has become an expert in the field of early years learning. There is a massive difference between being told about things by experts and being an expert, being the one of the people who finds these things out in the first place. <laughs> Jesus. I loved the line from Camilla Tomney. It comes after a team of academics were drafted in to help the Duchess shape her future with input from the highest echelons of government and the security services. This is wow. like so embarrassing that she needed a team of people to help her decide what she, what to do. And this is what they decided. This is what the <laughs> highest echelons of British government and the security services have come up with. It's, the mind boggles. <laughs> so this steering party of experts were enlisted to help Kate grow in stature. And Tommy refers to the speech therapist Lionel Logue's work with King George VI as depicted in the film The King's Speech to describe how Kate was given coaching by the image consultant and voice coach Anthony Gordon Lennox, who died in 2017. So this coaching was some time ago. Even if he was doing it up till the moment he (laughs) croaked. (laughs) The fruits of his labour are only becoming evident now, somehow. This is her line about it. An old Etonian... Gordon Lennox helped to coax out the Duchess's hitherto hidden sense of fun (laughs) and gave her the encouragement she needed to actually start enjoying public oratory as opposed to dreading it. This is so embarrassing. (laughs) She needed some old Etonian guy to show her how to have fun. That is just so weird. Why (laughs) was she incapable of having fun? (laughs) Also, she definitely still dreads public speaking. And they give another example from the Chelsea Flower Show two years ago where she was dreading speaking and she was shaking as if she was going to be interviewed by Jeremy Paxman instead of just talking to Monty Don. (laughs) (laughs) That doesn't even make any sense. Katie Nichol adds that the Queen asked Will and Kate to step up as frontline royals during the pandemic and... Tomini says that this is why they decided to do the train tour. Although the move was criticised by some for taking unnecessary risks, the general consensus is that the Cambridges have led the way in trying to connect with the public during the biggest national emergency in peacetime. I mean, led the way in trying, sure, but like that train tour was a fucking disaster. But that's not the general consensus. Yeah, I was talking to my mum, who I think is probably quite representative of what very pro-royal people would think. And she was really into the tour and she thought it was a really good thing for them to be doing. And she was saying, if they hadn't done it, you would be complaining they didn't do anything. And actually it's Nicola Sturgeon's problem for being so anti it. She's she's awful. So (laughs) um, I guess what we think is not the general consensus. No, no, of course not. I, I do think though, Kate earns her place first in line for getting this kind of glowing coverage on her 39th birthday, she's finally come of age. <laughs> Crazy. Her her laziness is her greatest virtue. <laughs> and she is the royal to be reckoned with, of all the royals. Absolutely. I just think it's so funny that, you know, this is, I guess, the second kind of big piece about Kate 
that we've talked about in kind of the last year. We obviously had the big Tatler piece, which was purporting to be a, a pro Kate thing, Catherine the Great, but that was you know quite shady. And obviously, we all know how that played out with the Cambridges taking or pursuing the option of legal action and all the editing that was then subsequently done. But this Telegraph piece is much more straightforwardly pro Kate and doesn't seem to be trying to make fun of her or trying to be shady. It's just that in order to praise Kate, you have to be so embarrassingly infantilizing. And it just sounds like utterly wild for like any adult who has like a normal life where they have to do normal stuff regularly anyway. And that is 39. Yeah. <laughs> so I-, I thought next week we were due to hear an update on Megan's case against the mail mm-hmm. and the summary judgment and all that stuff, but that's been pushed again. So it'll be the 19th of January when we get an update on that. So I was thinking it could be possibly fun. You know, I imagine the Royals aren't going to be doing a whole lot over the next week. Maybe we'll get another episode of R12 Audio and we can do another podcast about a podcast. <laughs> but otherwise... I thought it might be fun to talk a little bit about Bridgerton. Yeah. <laughs> Incredibly adjacent to the Royals, but I thought it might be like a sort of book club, TV club kind of thing we could do. Since yeah. Since we've read the books and seen the show. Yeah, that sounds fun. So if you want to follow along, you could watch Bridgerton on Netflix or read The Duke and I by Julia Quinn. Yeah, pick up a book, guys. <laughs> For once. The book is better. (laughs) Until then, thanks so much for listening. And we hope you have a great week. Stay safe. And take care. Bye. Bye. Quit fucking around and give it a shot. Come on.